morning. My name is Ed and I'm part of the uh, elder team here. I'd like to welcome everybody here to our worship service this morning, especially uh, guests who are visiting among us and also for those who are watching online. Uh, this morning we have uh, Pastor Norm bringing us the message. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. It is good to be together. The words of 1 John chapter 3 serve as our invitation to respond to God's love. How great is the love the Father has lavished, I love that word, lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. May you experience the love of God being lavished on you through Jesus, reminding you that wherever you are in your journey of life, whatever your struggle, whatever your fears, whatever your failures, whatever your successes, you are loved. And because God loves you, He sends Jesus to help you become all that He made you to be. And so we gather here as a people who recognize we're not there yet, that we have a long way to go, but who also recognize that because He loves us, He will forgive and accept and help us to grow in Him. In that hope and in that love, I invite you to stand and we will ask for His blessing. Father God, we thank You for inviting us into this place and for reminding us of how You have lavished Your love on each and every one of us. For You so loved the world that You sent Jesus, and we gather here on this Resurrection Sunday another one. Since last week, we continue to live in these Resurrection Sundays. We thank You for the hope that continues with us as we move forward. We pray that we will experience Your blessing today through Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And I invite you to open your hands and receive his blessing of grace to you and peace from God our Father through Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's continue to worship. Psalm 97 verse 1 says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. So let's be glad and rejoice together and by singing, uh, He reigns. It's the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven. Drowning out the Amazon rain The song of Asian believers Filled with God's holy fire It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation A love song born of a grateful choir It's all God's children singing glory children singing glory glory hallelujah he reigns he reigns let it rise above the four winds caught up in the heavenly sound let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns, and all the power 
powers of darkness tremble at what they've just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, He reigns. He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, He reigns. He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory. Jeremiah 10 verse 6 says, No one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. God is the giver of life, the epitome of love, the giver of hope, the restorer of broken relationships with himself, the sender of the Holy Spirit to live inside us. It's not just us, but all of creation worships God. And let's sing together, Great Are You, Lord.
let's um, enter into a time of confession. You call us to be your voices in this world, and we stay silent. You call us to be your hands in this world, and we keep them hidden. You call us to be your feet in this world, and we go our own way. When we meet those who are doubting and say nothing, forgive us. When we meet those who need your touch and do nothing, forgive us. When we are called to take up your cross and carry nothing, forgive us. Breathe life into these bones. Bring freedom to these lives that we might declare with heart and soul and voice that you are our Lord and our God. Amen. Hear these words. Come, all who are thirsty. If we take the first step, if we are willing to plunge once again into the waters and emerge into new life, we will receive a love beyond all we can envision. We turn our hearts to God, and by grace our hungers are satisfied. Our thirsts are sated. Through Christ we are made whole. By the Spirit we are led forth as God's people. Let's stand together and sing, all who are thirsty.
I'm going to say a prayer and then dismiss uh, our children off to uh, Maranatha kids. So let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for uh, the kids that attend this church. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for Maranatha kids and for, um, for the opportunity that the kids will get to uh, deepen their love for you, uh, to follow Jesus. Uh, Lord, we ask a blessing over them during this time. We ask a blessing over the leaders. Uh, that it would be a blessed time of uh, faith formation and uh, deepening love of you. Amen. Uh, kids are dismissed, ages three to grade five. Off to Maranatha Kids. Morning, my name is Dave. I'm one of the deacons here at Maranatha. Um, today's offering is once again for Urban Hope as it was last week. Uh, a few more things um, about Urban Hope. They are uh, open for lunch on Tuesdays and Sundays from 11 till 2. Dinner, Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 6 to 8.30. And they do that in partnership with uh, Missions to Margins. Uh, they also take clothing donations at, uh, I think, pretty much any time um, during the week as well and are always looking for volunteers. Let's pray. Oh Lord, Father in heaven, we come before you at the, uh, the morning time of this service to thank you for the opportunity to Bless those around us. So Lord, we pray that you will bless the monies and the help and the volunteerism that is given to Urban Hope. We pray that you will use this to help those who live on the margins in our community. We ask this in your name alone. Amen. I count on one thing.
before I lead you in uh, congregational prayer date, um, Tom Zalstra during the week had a, a fall and um, after he was discovered, he was rushed to the hospital. He is still in the hospital as the doctors, as he recovers and also as the doctors are trying to figure out uh, why he fell in the first place. So I'll pray for him as well. Shall we go to our Lord in prayer? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we see all around us much evidence of your presence, how you created the wonders of our world, your hand in the change of the seasons, and as we anticipate a display of your spectacular handiwork with the upcoming eclipse. We experience your blessing through the many relationships that we enjoy, especially our faith family sitting all around us. The comfort of knowing that our sins are forgiven and through Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, we can approach your throne without fear. As we contemplate all that you have blessed us with, help us also to share these blessings with those around us. Help us consider how you have blessed us and with humble submission, make our gifts in proportion to that blessing. We know you acknowledge and bless all of these gifts. Lord, as we enjoy freedom and abundance in this country, we can't help but cry out to you for those who live in regions where war and natural disaster have resulted in so much loss and uncertainty. We think especially of the war in Gaza and the Ukraine. We pray that you be especially with the leaders of these countries and those who advise them. Provide those who are on the front lines an extra measure of protection, endurance, and bravery. Lord, there are also so many among us who suffer with health, mental, financial, relational, and other concerns, many of which only you know about. We pray for Irene as she prepares for surgery on Friday. We pray that there may be no cancer found and that the surgery does not cause any setbacks for her other health concerns. We also pray for Tom as he recovers from his fall, provide guidance to the doctors as he recovers and they discover the reason for his blackout. We pray for Faye, Theody, and Robert, along with their family that support them. May they experience your grace and peace and healing. We pray for those who experience chronic and debilitating pain for those who struggle with and may need encouragement, give us the eyes to see it and the courage to provide the needed encouragement as well. We pray for those ensnared by addiction and those who are housebound, including Theody, Sandra, Alice, Jim, Grace, and my mom. We thank you for all those who have special relationships with us, our spouse, children, and grandchildren, our extended family, and those we count as friends. Thank you that there are those among us who will serve, whether that is right here in our congregation or around the world. Help us to provide them with the support they need through prayer, encouragement, and our financial support. Lord, we wish to, Lord, we wish to be older when we're young, and we often lament about our age when we get older yet every hour you give us is precious. Help us to celebrate life as the years pass by. And to that end, we thank you along with Nathan, Judah, Tim, Spencer, Peter, Jackie, jo Josiah, Natalie, Tim, Cameron, and Corey as they celebrate a birthday this week. Lord, as much as this is a corporate prayer, there are so many uniquely personal petitions and thanksgivings within this body that I know nothing about. Lord, you have promised to hear our prayer. And so at this time, I pray that you make your presence known in a special way to those who struggle. And may those who experience an extra measure of your blessing also lay the thanksgiving at your feet. I pray especially for those who experience you for the first time or those whose faith is waning. Please watch over your children. Protect the ember of their faith as they continue to grow in the knowledge of their Lord and Savior. 
We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. You'll find it on page 1597. 1597, Luke chapter 5, and we will read the first 11 verses. Luke 5, beginning at verse 1. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished, speaking, he said to Simon, go out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything yet. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And, And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So, we are a people who believe in God. But we're not just believers in God. There's a lot of people who believe in God. We believe in God through Jesus. We we are Jesus followers. That is, people who believe that God has especially shown Himself to us through Jesus. I find it helpful sometimes to imagine what was it like for the people of Jesus' day when they first met Jesus? What was it like for Peter, who was a believer in God, and then he meets Jesus? This was not the first time that Peter met Jesus. Of course, I'm calling him Peter, but his original name was Simon. That was his Jewish name. And when uh, Jesus meets Peter for the first time, Andrew introduces him, his brother Andrew. Jesus says, I'm calling you Cephas, which is uh, Aramaic for the word rock. And uh, Peter is the Greek version. So Cephas, uh, Peter means rock, and Simon was his original name, so he became known among the disciples as Simon Peter or Simon son of John, also called Peter or Cephas. You'll see those names interspersed throughout the rest of the Bible. And here, Peter has this amazing encounter with Jesus. And this is what I want to focus on, not only on this um, Sunday, but for three Sundays this month. I want to look at Jesus through the eyes of Peter. And I want to be seen by Jesus through the lens of Peter. I I want us to see the similarity between Peter 
and us. So I've called this series, Peter, just like us. So a little explanation for where this message and series first came from. It was my intention to do a series of messages on the ABCs of being a Christian. You're, you may have heard them by now if you've been here among us. I admit that I am a sinner, that I need Jesus to save me from the penalty and power of my sin. That's the I A. I believe in Jesus as my Savior and that I am God's child and His Spirit lives in me. And, and I commit myself to Jesus as my Lord and to living my life with Him in loving others. So I admit, I believe, and I commit. That, that's the series I was going to do. And when I thought about the admit part, I thought, what better way to start than using the words of Peter, which we've just read. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And so I set about reflecting on this passage. I, I, every morning I spent time praying through just what did I see in this particular story. But something wasn't sitting right with me. And I sensed the Lord saying, you're missing something. Okay, so I'm reading it over. And I did notice some interesting details, but I'll get into that later. But what struck me was that I approach this passage with a system in mind, the ABCs. I approach this passage with a theology. We are sinners. We are saved to serve. You may recognize those three words, uh, sinners, salvation, and service. Those are the three words of our traditions, Heidelberg Catechism. It's how we break down our theology. And I, I won't get into that, but the basic message is if you want to know uh, the comfort of, of, of God and Jesus, you need to believe these three things, that uh, our guilt, God's grace, and our response of gratitude. That's the three parts. But what I sense the Lord saying to me is, you're missing something. You're missing something. That explanation of those three things is question and answer two of the Heidelberg Catechism. This is the first sermon, and I'm starting at question two. Do you see what's missing? I bypassed question one. I jumped right away to, I'm a sinful man. And the Lord laid on my heart, let's spend a little time on the comfort that precedes that confession. Let's spend a little time and notice the grace that is shown to Peter first. So I looked at the passage again, and I noticed Peter is not following Jesus at this point. He's still fishing. And Jesus gets in his boat and continues teaching and then turns to Peter and says, repent and believe and follow me and then I'll give you many fish, right? No, no, no. There's no request of Peter at all. There's simply a, hey, Peter, you've been working hard. Get out there and try again. Peter, expert fisherman, doing this all his life. I, hey, I know what I'm doing, Jesus, but if you say so, okay. And so he goes out there and put out their nets and this huge, abundant, overflowing net full of fish. Like, so full, the nets were breaking. One boat couldn't contain it. Do you think there's a message in this? Oh, I know there's a message in this. It is another example of how God's grace precedes our response to that grace. God's love, I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, precedes my response. I commit myself to you and to loving you and loving like you. I fear that my approach to this story 
is not unique, but that this is a common problem. And we see it already in Peter. I'm not going to tell you all the details of Peter's life. In fact, what I want to do is give you a homework assignment. I invite you, use Google, use your Bible, use whatever tool you've got, and do a search of everything we know about Peter from the, from the Bible. There's a lot of stories about Peter. And those stories shed light not only on who Peter was, but on how Peter was after he met Jesus. And how this moment when he says, you know, Jesus says, I will make you a fisher of men, he doesn't suddenly change. He remains a sinful man. And he struggles for the rest of his life to understand God's grace. I believe as the Lord has been speaking to me through this passage, that this is an issue that many of us have, that we fail to understand God's grace first. So much so that Paul makes it his life's ambition, his calling to, to witness to God's grace. Listen to his words from Acts chapter 20. I consider my life worth nothing to me. Uh, I'm not there yet. I can't say that, but this is what Paul says. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. What is this task that drives him? This is his life's mission statement, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. It was a number of years ago where the Lord brought me to this verse and said, make this your passion as well. To let people know the radical, overwhelming, overflowing, boat-filling, net-breaking grace of God. Because if we don't understand the grace, we will not understand Peter's confession, I am a sinful man. Here's what happens when Christians don't understand the grace of God first that precedes our response. One possibility is that we experience then too much guilt. That is, we are so conscious of how unworthy we are that we never reach a point of finding comfort in God's grace. I don't know if you've met people like this, but I know within our church tradition there are people out there who never reach a point of feeling that they can take communion because they're not worthy. They're still working on understanding their sin, and yet it's like they've bypassed Lord's Day One and can't find that comfort. And I know there's many Christians, as they get older, they don't feel an increased sense of wonder at the grace of God, but they feel with every passing day, I'm not worthy. I, I, I can't be loved or forgiven. Or God, Can God accept me? That is tragic. The flip side is, other Christians become so aware of how blessed or graced they are that they think it sets them above others. And they look down on others who are not where they personally are. You may have heard the expression, there but for the grace of God go I. There's something true about that. That expression indicates that I am what I am, my life is what it is, only by the grace of God. God. God's kindness, God's favor, God's mercy. I am blessed not because I'm such a great person, but God. That, that's sort of the sentiment of it. And it's, it's very true on the one hand, but it's usually used in the context of someone else who's not in the same place, right? You see someone who is struggling with addiction and their life is a mess, and you say, oh, phew, there but for the grace of God go I. And the implication is, I'm grace, they're not. And the message communicated is somehow my position is 
better than theirs. That may not be what we mean, but sometimes that's what it becomes. And Christians lose sight of the fact that they are what they are, they have what they have, they know what they know, all because God has filled their nets a certain way. Those who are experiencing difficulty are not less graced. How God's grace is working in their life is very different, but they have grace that you don't have. It always interests me to see the people that Jesus celebrates, the ones that the religious leaders who would very quickly say there, but for the grace of God go I about tax collectors and prostitutes. And, and Jesus would say, actually, you don't get it. <laughs> as he invites the tax collectors and prostitutes around his table and the religious leaders don't come. And he says, you don't get it. You're, you're missing out on the grace. They're experiencing it. They've got a grace that you don't understand. So it's not about seeing ourselves as more grace than others or better than others. That's the danger of losing sight of grace. The third problem with not putting grace first is for people who are new to the Christian faith. People who've never uh, heard the story and then we come to them with this message, you are a sinner, you need to repent, and then you can be saved and forgiven. We first of all are communicating bad news, not good news. Despair, not hope. But we give them the impression that they need to do something before they can be loved. And there are some people for whom their experience of the message of Jesus is so negative, you're a sinner, that they can't even get to the point where they experience that grace. And so I hear the Lord saying to me, think about how I have graced you. Think about how I have filled your net to overflowing. Is it because you're better than others? This is where Peter comes in again. And as you do your search of the life of Peter, do you know how many times Peter has to be rebuked because he doesn't get it? Even after the resurrection, Paul in Galatians chapter 2 has to rebuke Peter. That's one of the stories you'll discover because he doesn't understand that God's grace to the Gentiles is equally free and overflowing as it is for the Jews. There's more examples of it. Peter is not just graced to become a believer. His whole life from beginning to end to the very end is all grace. And it is his lifetime response to that grace that enables him to grow and to change and to understand how amazing God's grace is. You heard me use that phrase, amazing grace, right? John Newton, amazing grace. That song captures well how God comes to someone who is so wrapped up in himself and unloving ways and blesses him. John Newton was a, a sailor on a slaving ship. He became a captain of slaving ships, transporting slaves to the new world. He became a Christian while he worked on the boat, not as the captain. He had this frightening experience of his own mortality in a huge storm, and he cried out to God for mercy, and God spared him in this storm, and he gave his heart to Jesus. Do you realize that it was years later before he figured out that slavery was wrong? As a Christian, he became a captain of a slaving ship. Now, some people noted that the way he treated the slaves was a little better. So maybe the spirit was working in him already there in that way. He didn't instantly become this, I once was lost and now I'm found. But for his whole life, he was growing in that amazing grace. And we see the same in Peter and we see the same in ourselves. It is grace that teaches my heart to fear. 
It is grace that helps me to see Jesus in a new way. It is grace that is at work long before I fully understand that grace because it is God's grace that invites us just as we are. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Grace is a, a word that I use a lot. and Maybe some of you are saying, well, what exactly do you mean by grace? The best explanation is calling it undeserved kindness. You know, this kind of thing where if you work with someone at work and they're really mean to you or they make your life miserable and then they, something happens to them and you rise up to defend them or you help them out even though they've been making life hard for you and they say, why are you being so nice to me? That's a little example of grace. Put this in the context of God. It's like Psalm 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Just imagine for a moment if God treated us exactly as our sins deserved. That's, it's like, that's the wow of grace. We pause for a moment and think how He has filled our nets. In our circles, we sometimes talk about our blessings. We count our blessings. And I've heard many of you say, I am so blessed. I am so, I, you know, and I look at my life and that, those are blessings. Blessings are just another word for grace. I am so graced. And grace and blessing are just another word for privilege. I know you'll sometimes hear the word privilege and being privileged in our world, but even the fact that we have hot and cold running water when we wake up in the morning is a huge privilege. The fact that we can choose between wearing this and that or between eating this and that, like those are huge privileges or blessings or, or graces. And it's not because we're better than those other people who don't have those blessings or graces or privileges. God's working in their lives differently. But just think for a moment of how God has filled your boat. Because when we experience God's grace like this, something happens. And that's why I'm not starting with Peter's words today. But I'll go there. Something happens. And that something is this awareness of, look at me in comparison to you and your love. I don't love like you love. I don't grace like you grace. I don't treat others like you treat me. It's just not there. I am a sinful man. Something changes. My hope through this series is to impress on you the amazing grace of God so that it works out in a change in how we think. My hope is that we will reconsider how we think of God's grace in our lives as if it sets us apart and makes us better. The Lord asked me, well, I, I sense the Lord encouraging me to tell you a little bit about my sabbatical coming up. It ties in with the message for uh, this month. Valerie and I are going to take the opportunity to walk the Peter path, in Dutch, the Peter pad. It's about the disciple Peter. In, you know, hundreds of years ago when, when the Christianity moved into Europe, they would build churches at the center and they would often name it after Saint Peter. So uh, you'll find many communities where they'll have a St. Peter's Catholic Church of one form or another. And, and this Peter path that we will be following is a walking trail from the very north of the Netherlands in Peterburen, that's what it's called, all the way down to St. Petersburg, Maastricht, very south. It's a, it's a hill. There was a St. Peter's Church in Peterburen. And the, the word literally means... Peter's neighborhood. That's the Dutch way of saying Peterborough, right? The neighborhood around St. Peter's Church. Notice it's only called Peterburn, not St. Peterburn. And what strikes me about that, this is sort of a spiritual uh, way of thinking, but it starts with Peter just being one of us. You know, just sitting among us in the neighborhood. Not better, not higher, not holier. 
Now, when you move from the very north of the Netherlands, just some re re religious geography, it is very Protestant in the north and very Catholic in the south. And that's just the way the history unfolded. But one of the things that the Catholic Church fell into was this trap of elevating Peter to such a high place that it created a separation, right? And, and St. Petersburg is this moment, I, I'm using it as an analogy, if Peter's just one of us in the neighborhood, St. Petersburg is that rock or that mountain, that solid place in Matthew chapter 16, where Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Peter, Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. On this mountain, I will build my church. Now, the, the Catholic tradition sees that as proof that Peter is first among everyone else. He's now Jesus' representative on earth. So he's elevated, which seems to be very opposite of the message of Jesus meeting Peter in the neighborhood. Peter does make this bold confession, but even there Jesus says, look, Peter, you didn't come up with this by yourself. This was revealed to you by your Father in heaven. That's another evidence of grace. You didn't figure it out yourself. And you still don't fully understand because in the very next few verses when Jesus says, you know, I'm, I'm going to die on the cross, Peter says, never, Lord, never. You're not going to die. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. In one breath, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Father reveals to him. In his next breath, you'll never die. Get behind me, Satan. It's like this moment of tension where we wrestle with understanding properly God's grace in Jesus and mistaking it for a position of power and advantage. So we're not stopping there. That's where our walking will end. But we'll be going to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. They're all B's, eh? Burren, neighborhood, Berg, mountain, basilica, palace. It's the word for king or ruler. So that's the place of the king or the ruler, basilica. Christians often turn the grace of God into a position of an advantage and power. They protect themselves from the world and make the world come to them on their terms. If you follow these rules, if you live this way, then you may become a part of our community. But remember, we're one step above you. I'm not saying that this is um, true, obviously, but nor am I saying that we all equally fall into this. I just know that I, this spiritual journey for me will be a time to reflect on the life of Peter and ask myself, am I turning the grace of God only into a privilege for myself or a blessing or a grace for myself that makes me feel better about myself and distances me from those around me? Grace is the ultimate leveler. It reminds me then that I am no better or worse than the addict at House of Friendship. Or I am no better or worse than the homeless person that has to go get food at Urban Home or the food bank. And the grace of God is not only setting me apart to make me so that I'm not like that, but the grace of God is at work in them too. Grace is the ultimate leveler. And it ought to lead us to say, wow, I don't deserve this either. How can I treat others in a way that they deserve when I don't get treated in the way I deserve? I need grace. They need grace. And it is this grace that Paul testifies to, and I feel called testify to with Paul and Peter, and I want to do better is what I want to communicate because I believe this is how God changes people's lives. I want to finish with one more story, which is a beautiful illustration of how grace and not the call to repent or feel awful as a sinner first, but undeserved grace and blessing changes lives. And it's the story of a man named Daryl Davis, still alive today, black man, who struggled with, obviously, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, the white supremacist movement that 
sees the need to separate and to look down. And, but he decided to approach this differently. He made it his mission to sit down with, meet with, befriend members of the KKK. He was in Maryland. He's still there as far as I know. Um, he still meets when he can with people who belong to the KKK. And one man was a, an imperial wizard, Roger Kelly. And he met with this man and he befriended him. Now, just tease those words out for a moment because Roger Kelly didn't want to befriend him. He saw him as different. But through the conversation, he picked up on enough grace from this Daryl Davis that he was willing to keep the conversation going. Daryl didn't say, you know, uh, I agree with you. He said, I want to know your story. I want to know why you think the way you think and why you look at me the way you do. And I'm willing to talk and listen and be a part of this conversation. But if you're willing, I'm willing to sit down with you. Now, I don't know how long that story went, but eventually, Roger Kelly, imperial wizard of the KKK, gave up his imperial robe and gave it to Daryl Davis. Not only that, he asked Daryl to be the godfather of his daughter. How on earth does this happen? What happened in Roger Kelly that suddenly his views would change and he would now rethink, that's what the word repent means, how he saw the world? It was the kindness of Daryl Davis that led Roger Kelly to repentance. Now, this is not just a one-off. Daryl Davis has been instrumental in befriending over 220, no, sorry, 20 KKK members directly responsible for changing between 40 and 60 of them and indirectly responsible for seeing over 200 KKK members giving up their robes, changing their views. There is power in kindness and grace. It changes Peter. It helps him to see the world in a whole new way. It changes John Newton. Not immediately. He's still a slaver for years, but eventually he comes to see this is terrible. I'm a wretch. And then he writes his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And that's the message that this story from Luke 5 speaks to me. Above all else, you are graced like Peter. I want you to know that. You are not falling short of God's approval rating. God loves you not because you're good enough. God loves you not because you're smart enough, not because you believe the right things, not because you've got enough good deeds on your books. God does not look at you in any other way as his, and than as your his precious child. He created you. Oh, he knows you're not what he created you to be. But he also longs to restore you to what he created you to be. And, and for those of you who struggle with feeling the love of God, who jump to Lord's Day to, or question and answer to like I do and say, I'm such a sinner, please, Repeat over and over again the words of Lord's Day question and answer one. I belong to Jesus, body and soul and life and in death, despite all my strengths and weaknesses, despite my pride or shame. I am not my own. I belong to him. I am loved. I am graced, just like Peter just like you, just like everyone. Amen. If I can invite the team forward at this time, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we are going to sing, I am not my own. And I hope that this message will be impressed deep in your hearts and your minds. Please stand with me 
as we pray. Father God, we are not what you made us to be. We are nowhere near what we should be. We are nowhere near what Jesus was. We are nowhere near the love that you have shown for us. But one thing we know, we are not what we used to be because of your grace. And because of your love, we are what we are, and our hope is in Jesus. May we all see our graces, our blessings, our privileges in a whole new light. And may we all fall before you in wonder and say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Jesus, you are the love of God. And as we look in your face, you remind us that nothing can separate us from God's love. Thank you for dying for us so that we may live, for loving us so that we may love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing, I am not my own.
I knew I, I know I threw out there, you know, you have a homework assignment. The reality is only about 2% of you might do it, but I'll, I'll, I'll still put it out there again. Do a search on Peter, everything you can find out about Peter. For the next month, we're going to look at stories relating to Peter. So it'd be really helpful if you would just look into the story of Peter and what we can see of Jesus through the eyes of Peter. And if it's helpful, look up the story of Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis. Fantastic to see how grace can work in a way to change people's lives. And finally, say with me, I am graced just like Peter. I am graced just like Peter. Now look around you and say with me, they are graced just like Peter. Let's say it. They are graced just like Peter. Oh man, Lord, may the Lord impress this message on our heart. Okay, let's receive his blessing. Open your hands and your hearts to receive it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen? Amen. 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 Have a God week. Be quiet.